anything. Why, thank you. I suppose you want a show now, right? I'm Johnny Carson. I'm the, uh, I'm the one who didn't enter the New Hampshire primary. <laughs> I'm your middle-of-the-road comedian. My campaign slogan is, let them eat jokes. I didn't say it was a funny campaign slogan. We are starting late, I guess, around most of the country tonight because of the uh, New Hampshire uh, primary. So if, if we're at 12 o'clock, where we're normally 11.30, you'll understand it. Sermonette would be a big hit following the New Hampshire primary tonight. I mean, well... Do you dig it? I have no comment on that. Jackets it's, by Congolium. That's... <laughs> that's better than what I had. Uh, Ed is off uh, doing something, and uh, Doc moves over here, and Mr. Uh, Thunderbolt. Uh, Tommy knew some... Uh, how are you tonight, Tom? Very well, thank nice you. Nice to see you uh, standing there. <laughs> Tommy, as I said, is a fine musician and arranger, but he's not the most noticeable of people. Uh, if you call Tommy's house and he answers the phone, Tommy will say, will you wait just a moment? I'll, I'll see if I'm here. <laughs> and, uh, and Tommy's having a tough time keeping up with this whole political thing going on. He thinks Sergeant Shriver is a children's show in Canada. <laughs> Obviously, some of you share that belief also. Uh, well, before we start, here's a late score from the newsroom. Burton and Taylor, four. Sonny and Cher, three. <laughs> I suppose most of you have seen in the newspapers or on television that Burton and Taylor are getting divorced again. Uh, I'm getting to the point where I really don't care anymore. I can't keep up with it. Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, the greatest love story ever told. And they keep on telling it uh, again and again. Uh, apparently, you never know uh, what really happens, but apparently what happened broke up the, the marriage was that Miss Taylor, apparently, according to the news, was having some kind of a relationship with a, with a gentleman from Switzerland. And um, I think Burton suspected that something was going on because he came home one night and there was a, a wedge of cheese in the ashtray. <laughs> I don't. That's a strange couple, I'll tell you. I understand Burton is enrolling in the Schick Center to stop marriage. Uh, anyway, let's go to the news and see who's losing in New Hampshire besides the United States. Um, the primary, of course, was today. And I don't think even th this, this time of night all of the results are, are in yet. But I can give you, I can read you right now, a few quotes that you will read in the newspapers tomorrow. For example, this has been a great victory for us. We didn't expect to get half this many votes. Now, those will be all the statements made by the losers. You realize that? Always, because, um, well, what's that place up there? Dick, Dixville Notch? Is that a town or a little community? 16 people. That's 16 people, I guess, up in New Hampshire. Does somebody know? Is White Mountains? Yeah, that's where the first primaries come in. And the first significant returns came in there. Uh, to give you an idea, 11 voted for Ford. Uh, four people voted for Reagan. Ronald McDonald and Mr. Whipple each got two votes <laughs> apiece to give you an idea. Yeah. That fight between Ford and Reagan in New Hampshire has created about as much excitement as the Alley Koopman fight. <laughs> Did you see that? That was bad. Huh? That was a very quick fight, wasn't it? Ford says he'll be happy if he gets only one vote. And come to think of it, that's more than one vote he got for president. <laughs> So he's going to be happy. <laughs> uh, the New Hampshire primary actually is a, is a lot like Preparation H. Uh, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give us some temporary relief by shrinking the candidates. So, uh, you know, why not? I think... Uh, Personally, I think both Ford and Reagan are glad the New Hampshire primaries are over because neither one of them want to pay another week's rental on their ski clothes. <laughs> Did you realize that Nixon received a vote? Nobody know who voted for Nixon, but it came in an absentee ballot from Peking. <laughs> uh, you obviously know that former President Nixon is out of the country, and he is in China, and he met with uh, Chairman Mao 
for about an hour and 45 minutes. And after the meeting, Nixon said, time sure flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? I don't, nobody really knows what he's doing over there. But anyway, after the historic meeting, Chairman Mao told Nixon to give his best to Ford and the Panda. <laughs> Years ago, they sent some pandas over here. <laughs> Did you know, while Nixon was over there, I like that when I put that one in for me. He said to say, <laughs> said to say hello to the panda. <laughs> it's kind of amusing. How would they know <laughs> what? How would they know which one to say it to? How would he know which one to say it to? <laughs> Ford's eyes are bigger. <laughs> uh, did you realize during that whole visit in China that the subject of Watergate? never came up, and Nixon had never mentioned it. Same as here, when he was here. <laughs> well, let's see what else is happening today. There is a little diplomatic difference that has arisen over this trip. Um, Nixon seems to have uh, riled a few tempers over here, because Kissinger says when Nixon gets back, the government wants to talk to him about the trip, and Ford says he doesn't want to talk with him. So they've worked out a, a kind of a compromise, what they're going to do. Uh, Kissinger's going to have a conversation with Nixon and then uh, tape it, and then Rosemary Woods is going to e edit the tape for, for Gerald Ford. So it'll all work out. Anyway. Whereas uh, this week, see now, Kissinger's been in Venezuela, he's been in Peru, and this week I think he is in Panama. And he's worked out a wonderful deal with Panama. He is going to have uh, the government of Panama furnish new hats to the FBI agents. It's one of those little things he did on the trip. <laughs> now, here's another story. Oh, I, I also did that one for me. Did you see this on the news? And it was in the paper. There was a rumor. Now, who knows whether it's true? We'll probably never know that President Kennedy smoked pot in the White House. Did you see that? In, I mean... To paraphrase Abraham Lincoln, I, I think we ought to find out what brand he was smoking and send a case of joints to Ford. Uh, well, anyway, see, Lincoln originally said that about General Grant. And Lincoln didn't get a laugh either when he did it, which is why they got him at the theater. Anyway, tonight we have, no, we have Joy Bishop is with us tonight, Mr. Freddie Prinze. Betty Garrett and Ray Johnson. And we'll be pictured. Yes, I got the company. We'll be right back. <laughs> Thank you. We're back. And applause. And applause. Have you worn that before? Oh, I would yes. certainly remember that. Well, uh, I wear them in rotation, and I'm around to this for the second time. That is wild. First time I wore it was about three, four years ago. It takes that long to get around. To get around your whole wardrobe? Around the whole wardrobe. <coughs> I want something that's going to perk me up a little bit. All right. So Tomorrow's please, the big day, though. If you just join us, we have tomorrow. What happens tomorrow? Band party. And film you have, You're having your annual uh, band party tomorrow night? Yes, we call it... Uh, uh, a choir practice. You know, yeah, once a year, the band has... Los Angeles, please. Well, I, I hope they don't sink the boat from Columbia before it gets here. Well... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a nice and it's a... I was there last year. You do it's nicely. It's nice, it was a very aesthetic party. A lot of traffic in and out of that place. <laughs> uh, had a, uh, an interesting... Uh, Memo here from a gentleman by the name, not, not a, yeah, Vern. Vern, that would be a gentleman, wouldn't it? Possibly. Well, do you know any girls named Vern? Yes, I do, as a matter of fact. You would. All right. <laughs> from Z Vern Zebart of Dickinson, North Dakota. And this is kind of interesting. Remember the other night we read a list of uh, rules for doctors that somebody had come up with in the mm -hmm. year, something like 1,320 in England, rules for physicians? This gentleman found some aircraft pilot rules issued in 1920. Now, you know, they hadn't been flying too long in 1920, but these were rules for pilots. These are the actual reprint. Don't take the machine into the air unless you are satisfied it will fly. <laughs> it's true. Never leave the ground with a motor leaking. 
In taking off, look at the ground and the air. <laughs> Sound pretty... I love this one. Pilots should carry hankies in a handy position to wipe off goggles. <laughs> Do not trust altitude instruments. If you see another machine near you, get out of the way. <laughs> pretty good. Never run the motor so that the blast will blow on other machines. Before you begin a landing, see that no machines are under you. These are pretty basic rules. Don't turn sharply when taxing. Instead of turning short, have someone lift the tail around. Remember when they used to do sure. that in movies? Hedge hopping will not be tolerated. If flying against the wind, and you wish to turn and fly with the wind, don't make a sharp turn near the ground. You might crash. Yes. <laughs> don't attempt to force machine onto ground with more than flying with more than flying speeds. The result is bouncing and ricocheting. Pilots will not wear spurs while flying. <laughs> Never take a machine into the air until you are familiar with its controls and instruments. If emergency occurs while flying, land as soon as you can. You know, huh. you know, 1920. I'm, I'm glad that rules. tonight you, you read that. You know, Ed being gone and all, uh, it's fortunate that I'm here here because there is nobody in the world who is more interested in flying mm -hmm. than I am. I see. I love to fly. Flying is my life, uh -huh. you might say. Uh -huh. And it's amazing that to me, a man interested in flight as much as I am, that you would re have, th look at the size of that yes, piece of paper. Want... Everything wow. that you would ever want to know about the mysteries of flight. <laughs> Wrong, pucker person. I want to tell you. No, they didn't cover everything. That might have been good for 1920. 20, right. We have updated this somewhat. We have rules for pilots in 1976, which we think are a little more au courant, as they say. Somebody says that. Do not take off if someone in the cockpit is wearing a ski mask. <laughs> if your instrument panel malfunctions, you know you are climbing too fast if your underwear is around your ankles. <laughs> Avoid an airport whose instrument landing system is a guy playing the saxophone on runway four. <laughs> Pilots should observe VIP protocol. Dip your wings and salute if you pass Jack Ford at 10,000 feet. <laughs> Pilots should avoid taking aboard any passenger whose luggage has a wick. <laughs> Pilots of private planes should not engage in pranks, such as using their propeller to tailgate people on hang gliders. <laughs> If you're a pilot of a cheap airlines, never let the passengers in the economy section know that they are in a U-Haul. <laughs> if your plane should experience mechanical problems, do not let the passengers bail out over Lion Country Safari. These are just little things. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Those are au courant. Yes, they certainly are. <laughs> see where the good ones are. <laughs> Is there another page? There, 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 I have some here, but uh, I know who we got on the show. He's holding up the guests. <laughs> He's panicking. Uh, if your in-flight movie is the Hindenburg, and after the picture is over, you still see flames, set a good example by not locking yourself in ocupado. That's wonderful. <laughs> in extreme emergency, if you cannot avoid crashing the plane, try to hit Philadelphia. No, now that is not true at all. Don't send letters from Philadelphia. Those are the latest we have from Over 1976. Off. Over off. <laughs> that thing will never fly. Let's see if I can still remember this from school. Remember this? There's my, there was the material for that bit. <laughs> Crash, the whole material. <laughs> Why doesn't that fly? <laughs> we make great ones in school. What, did I make that wrong? I think you did, yes. You didn't fold it enough times. What do you mean? Well, we'll try that later. Anyway, we have Joy Bishop with us tonight, Freddie Prinz, Betty Garrett, and Mr. Ray Johnson. And we will do this first. Do you know where your coughs come from? <laughs> Watch this and this. Oh, hi, 
Hi there. Sorry. Just imitating an NBC vice president here. <laughs> See, when you make these paper airplanes, I forgot. Yeah, I, I didn't. I, I had one more fold. Then you should actually put a paper clip in the nose, you see. Then when you see the kid in school and you zing that right at the back, you get him right in the back of the neck. We'll see how that works. That really sets him up good. Give it a This shot. is gonna fly like crazy. Watch this. Clear over to the band. <laughs> Isn't that strange? It went right on the monologue, Martin. <laughs> okay, my first guest is a close friend, a very, very funny man. I've been a fan of Joy's for many, many years. And if memory serves me correctly, he's made a number of appearances on this show. In addition to being here, he will appear on Chico and the Man tomorrow night. That's interesting, because we have Freddie Prince later. Would you welcome Mr. Joy Bishop? This is one of the most exciting nights of my life. I, I'm finally getting to meet him. <laughs> you son of a gun. Finally. After all of these times. Listen, I, first of all, I want to thank you very, very much because you're a very, very gracious person. Uh, each time I pinch it for you, right. you never failed the next night when you returned to thank me. That's true. I, think I may I, have done I it 150, did. 200 times. Right. You always thank my friend, except one night, I have the date here. <laughs> July the 11th, 1970. It was a Tuesday. I pinched it on a Monday. Yeah. You came back, and you didn't thank me. And I've been watching the show now for five and a half years, <laughs> hoping. And I thought maybe this would be a heck of a good time for you to thank me for pinching for you in 1970. Then you won't be obligated. I, I want to thank Joy Bishop for doing a great job on the show. What was, what, what was the name? Wait a minute. I wasn't pinching for you. I was pinching for somebody who was pinching for you. Ah. Well, I want to thank Joy, who was substituting for the guest host. Right. Who was reached on March 3rd, 1970. How are you, anyway? I'm fine. How Good are you feeling? Good to see you. Good to see you, too. You're doing Chico and the Man tomorrow night? I did it. And, yeah, that's uh, right. Right. It's a uh, delightful show to do. Now, you, did you play you, or I, did you? I play, uh, I didn't play myself. I played a guy named Charlie, who was an insult comic, a la Rickles, but couldn't make enough money to pay for the hospital bills that he uh, got from... from insulting people. So I become a crook. And uh, Chico convinces Ed, the old man, to keep the garage open all night. And the first night they're open, I rob him. <laughs> you know, Having seen you work and knowing the way you work, you're, you're basically a reaction comedian. You play off of things, and yet, although you've done tape shows or film shows, don't you find that format sometimes where you're working on film a, a little confining? Don't you kind of like a freewheel? I know oh, yes. I do. You can get up and you, you work an audience and you stop yeah. and you go over here, but when you get locked into the script, you got to do it. I think this type of show, unfortunately, you're healthy all the time, but <laughs> this type of show, I think, is the easiest. Uh, I don't mean as far as talent, because I, I, I do. Uh, they interviewed me. I don't know whether you saw it or not. They interviewed quite a few of us. And I told them what I thought of your, uh, I of your talents. And I think you know, a lot of guys can do this for a year or two. I almost lasted a month. <laughs> uh, can do it for a year or two, but you've been on for so many years. It, it really amazes me how you are still able to come out there, really, and, and do it. And Thank I you. think it's a... A tribute to your talent. Well, I think you don't have to say that. Uh, now, let's see. Now, I say something nice about Joey, <laughs> and then you say something nice. No, you didn't have to say that. You know that, because I, no. I get a little embarrassed when people say that, but I know you mean it. I do. And I thank you. I mean it. Uh, no, uh, it's just myself respecting the talents of yeah. a great, great talent. I got out of the car today, and I was in the parking lot. You happened to be out there, and I was smoking a cigarette. And I looked at you, and I was, I was envious for a moment, because I, you used to be one of the great smokers of all Five times. packs a day. Five packs a day? Five, I used to smoke a pack oh, well, I, I, during a 90-minute show. Well, That's a I've fact. I've never now. done I'm, that. I'm not lying. And uh, it's been about eight years, and people say, do I miss it? You know, once in a while, I find myself striking a match and lighting my nose. <laughs> I have a friend of mine who's really 
really a, a fiend. Five. A natural. Five, five packs. I'll, if I tell you the brand, then you'll no, go, wow. No, no, don't. You know, because it's a strong brand. Friend, now some people, forgive me, but some people smoke after sex. I got a friend who smoked during sex. <laughs> You will not believe where he puts his ashes. <laughs> that is called savoir faire. Sure. You can pull that up. So five packs a day. What happened? Now you may have discussed this yeah. before, and without preaching, because as you as you know, there's nothing worse never. than a reformed smoker or drinker who now patronizes and says it's a terrible thing, which it probably is. How did you? Why did you decide to do it? Okay, I was going. It was uh, November of '68. I was going to Vietnam. Right. And I decided for the three weeks that I was going to be over there, I wasn't going to smoke. So I boarded the plane. And we left to Seattle. I boarded the plane, threw away the cigarette, and didn't smoke for the three weeks that I was over in Vietnam. I never felt like smoking again. That's never. Incredible. I did have one substitute. They had a cigarette come out with lettuce leaves. I don't know if you're familiar. Oh, no I tar, that. no I nicotine. That. And you can smoke it, and it's terrific. I find it very difficult. To give up? Yes. Well, you, I gained 35 pounds when I quit smoking. That's I compensating, swear. isn't it, for uh, While I was your... eating, I was thinking of what to eat. <laughs> I swear to you. I was eating a roast beef sandwich. I said, when I finish this, I think I'll have a hamburger. I just never. But you got rid of that. You got, huh? rid, of the, you got rid of the weight. Then I got rid of, I went, went on a diet. I, I, I became very, very conscious of diets. Do you feel better? Is everything better? Is your Let sex me put life it this better? Way. I would change places with you in a minute. <laughs> no. Is my wife life better? Is your sex life better? I hear that all the time. They say you quit smoking, your sex life improves. I knew I had a reason for quit smoking. <laughs> no, I don't. Improved? Well, I mean. Uh, That's uh, assuming that I wasn't doing too well in the first place. No, I didn't mean. I didn't mean that you weren't a hit. Oh, okay. you have more energy, you have um, uh, greater desire. Uh, uh, I have a greater desire, but I don't think I have the energy. <laughs> I knew there was a hook in this whole thing. We've got to take a break. We're coming right back. We're talking to Bill Bishop. We have Freddie Prinz with us, Betty Garrett and Ray Johnson. We're talking about the joys of not smoking, but first not joys because you, you gained 35 pounds. Right. What on a, you have to keep on a diet. Forever after you quit smoking? Uh, well, unfortunately, I have uh, since encountered uh, ill health, so I'm on a very strict diet to begin with. And I'm thankful to God, because of what I have now, that I had stopped smoking right. when I did. But uh, I, I was never heavy, except for the time I gained weight. Mm. But I always uh, watch my weight. They have diets that can drive you nuts. The you organic know. foods, the health foods. Like I, a, a guy, he's on a prune diet. I don't know who he is, but I know where you can find him. <laughs> I had to ask. You, um, when are you going to Vegas? I open Vegas Thursday. And each time I go there, I follow Buddy Hackett. He's up there now with Sammy Kahn, I believe. Have you ever seen Buddy Hackett? You've seen him. Have you ever oh, seen him? Oh, yes. Yes. I was there the last time I followed him in. I was closing night. I sat behind two nuns who must have gotten in there by mistake. <laughs> oh. He was on five minutes, and one nun said to the other, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> or words to that effect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he is really... He is, and I'm, I have the lovely Teresa Brewer on uh, show, co-starring with Yeah, me. she's a doll. Yes. She never ages, that, that, that lady. No. You know, from the time she started, she's still got that little teeny voice. Yeah. And still is like a teenager. So you, you work up there two weeks? Two weeks. Unless you heard something, John. No, no, no. Are you going to come back and do television? I hear rumors. But, you know, this town is based well, on rumors that everybody's going to do a show. and you're thinking I'm involved in something I've written. I haven't submitted it yet. But I think it's going to be exciting. Now, you've seen celebrity tennis, right? Right. Celebrity golf, celebrity bowling. I'm going to host a show called Celebrity Sex. <laughs> Two well-known couples. <laughs> One couple gets shot out of a cannon into a nearby motel. <laughs> and what they do in midair, that's their business. It's, it's a very, I'm kind of excited the about The slow motion it. replay will be the uh, clincher. Oh, though. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and in slow-mo. What would you, you've been watching the television season, and we've kidded it, because it's, even though it's our medium, why you can kid television, it's not been the most electrifying season 
that's come down the pike. Right. You watch a lot of it? I, I think I'm as avid a TV fan as... I do, because avid. it's our business, and I, I like never, to know what's going I, on. I watch it all the time. I would like to see, for example, certain things when I see them. I wonder, I, I question them. I would like to meet Mrs. Olson's husband and find out what he thinks about her coffee. You know, little things like that. Like to see uh, Lassie stop at a tree once. Never, never see that. I would like to see Muhammad Ali squeeze Mr. Whipple. <laughs> little things like that, I guess. You brought up Mrs. Olson. Now, this is just, there's no joke, yeah. but it's interesting. She wrote me a very nice letter once because we've done jokes about her, and she's a lovely actress. Uh, and I forget her name, um, Virginia. She's a be beautiful. Excuse me? No, not Graham. Excuse me, I didn't hear her last name. Fields. No, it's not. She's married to Fritz Feld. That's right. right. She's a beautiful... F-E-L-D. You don't remember Fritz Feld? Sure. Uh, who always went around and played the, the, head, uh, the head waiter, the little right. fellow with a... Yeah, she's a lovely lady. She's married to him. I don't know why I brought that up. You know who I really feel sorry for? I know it's going to sound stupid. The tidy bowl man. Well, now, but we never analyzed this. But you, you see the commercial, right? And you just see a guy in a boat and a toilet tank, right? But chances are, this guy studied dramatics. <laughs> you know, he came out to California. Now, can you imagine... Get into show business? Right, he's gonna... Can you imagine the very first time he's in that tank, a neighbor sees it and runs into his mother's house and says, Mr. Schwartz, I just saw your son on TV. <laughs> and the mother it? says, we're doing what? He says, well, he's in a bowl. <laughs> you mean like football? No, no. I don't know how to tell you this, but he's in the... He's floating around in the tank of a toilet. And the mother said that some career, one flush, it's all over. <laughs> Things like that make you kind of wonder. I don't know why that stuff goes on. I, I feel sorry for the guy who writes on his nose. It's the same thing. Who runs around out with oh, a yeah. crayon and writes on his nose. He starts up here at the party. Starts up here and tears these things off. Yeah. He's got numbers on his nose. And he wanted to be in show business, and that's what he's doing now. Somebody else did a routine once. Uh, some young comedian on the show. And it's true. The guy you really feel sorry for is that skier on the wide world of sports every oh, week. Yeah. yeah. Who, three years later, every week, you know, he's made a thousand jumps, beautiful, right. probably a hundred meters. But what do they show week after week? The agony of this poor guy comes over and breaks every bone in his body for the thousand. Actually, times. he just won an award for skiing the longest on his behind <laughs> than anybody else. <laughs> he I got a five-six. Yeah. Do you do when you, when you talk? Do you, do you get involved politically at all? Do you talk about I used what's to, going on? I used to get involved politically. I think the last time I was actively involved, well, I did the inaugural for uh, John right. F. Kennedy. Right. And uh, I'm a little worried now. I mean, when I hear President Ford say he's thinking of going to West Germany to talk to the Kaiser. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little worried. But then they say, can Ronald Reagan, you know, an actor, make a good president? He's not an actor. Yeah. And he's got about 40 movies that can prove it. <laughs> don't you bring up... Don't you mention... Don't mention... Don't mention Bonzo Goes to College. Because Freddie D. Cordova directed Bonzo Goes to College, oh, yes. a producer of our show, and two Bonzo pictures you did, right? Yes. And there was talk of a third. There was talk of a third, and Bonzo said, enough is enough. <laughs> Bonzo's agent came in. It was a, a... I don't like to really get involved in politics. I don't know whether... Some people think it's right for a public figure. But I think you carry a lot of weight, for example, and I think people unquestioningly, if you said endorse somebody... I don't. I, st I try to stay do. apolitical. However, in my heart, I feel that if our country is jeopardized and it's not political uh, as far as candidates, then I have a right to speak out. Sure. I think, like, we're concerned about Russia, Red China. I think the country we really have to look out for is Switzerland. <laughs> Do you see the reaction I got now? Right away. That's the same reaction I got in 1951 when I warned them about Holland. <laughs> no. I, according to statistics, there are 26,000 Swiss people in this country. Right. Now, answer me honestly. Right. Have you ever met a Swiss? Mm, come to think of it. Uh... Well, 26,000 of them hiding out somewhere, right? <laughs> Am I right? You got a point there. They have their Independence Day, August the 1st. That's when they celebrate their independence. Yeah. Now, you know, I mean, let's, uh, let's analyze it. While we're on vacation, they're celebrating, you know. A little thought, just want to drop a little hint there. <laughs> Population of six million, yeah. and they export 55 million clocks and watches. <laughs> Why? 
You know what I mean? Never. Like, for example, and they have like little little things that are subliminal, you know, like the cuckoo clock. Well, you hear cuckoo, right? right. You know what cuckoo means in Swiss? <laughs> Blow it out. <laughs> oh, my check on that. Well, don't have to check on it. I wouldn't come here without facts. <laughs> now, our national flower in this country is the rose. The rose. You know what the national flower is? You know what their favorite dish is? In? No, what's their favorite dish? Fondue. <laughs> okay, think it over for just a second. <laughs> their national flower is the Edelweiss. The Edelweiss. Now, I tell you this because if they should ever take over, on New Year's Day, we'll be watching our television sets, we'll be watching the Edelweiss Bowl. <laughs> just little, I'm only trying to help my country. And that whole parade with all those floats? Be all Edelweiss. Edel, all Edelweiss. That's, that's you wanted me to get involved. I and didn't you, want to you, get involved. You wouldn't lie to us. You came here with the facts on this. John, when I come out here, you remember, remember one thing. I'll learn you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never. I never come out and, uh, and make up uh, things like this. These are absolute facts. Well, that'll give us something to think about. Switzerland. Just watch it. Think about it. Remember, he warns you. <laughs> Take a break. We'll be right back after this. The Edelweiss. I can know it. Bring out Freddie. I did not go. I guess I knew, but we've known each other for what, about 15 or 20 years? I did. It uh, never... I pinched it for you when you were doing Who Do You Trust? That's right. And that's a few years ago. And right. it doesn't seem right to sit here and say you're a grandfather now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You like uh, that idea? Yes. Yeah. Really? Not too crazy about the fact I'm sleeping with a grandmother. But... Yeah, that's what I. <laughs> <laughs> Psychologically. How old is the grandchild? Uh, he'll be five months old tomorrow, as a matter of fact. Oh, when I walk in the house and I hear, bleep, 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 that's my son. <laughs> then I talk to the kid. No, I'll tell you, if there are any grandparents out there, then you know. And I, I know I sound corny, and I know you've heard it a thousand times, but it's the life because when it's your own kid, when you play with him, you still have to father him, right? When it's your grandkid, as soon as you, you can... stop being playful, here's your kid. <laughs> my biggest thrill is I... when I walk into that house. And I pick that kid up, and he looks in my eyes, and he spits on me. <laughs> and I realize that I paid for everything he's got. <laughs> no, it's honestly, are you a grandfather? Thanks, like, what? Uh, I, Am I a grandfather? <laughs> not, not that I know of. I've got, <laughs> I, I've got three, three boys, but they're, they're not married yet. Huh. <laughs> no, no, they have not informed me. You know, funny thing about grandparents, as soon as somebody says there's a grandparent, the audience dutifully kind of goes like this, yeah. like you've just accomplished something wonderful. You had nothing to do with becoming a grandparent. Well, you talk about my kid knew nothing about sex. I told him. Ah, never thought of that. Of course, for heaven's sake. He thought he was supposed to carry. <laughs> my next guest will be working with you tomorrow night, or has worked with you tomorrow right. night. As one, you know, he is one, one, of, the, one of the co-stars at his tender age of 22 of Chico and the Man, which is on NBC's Wednesday night at 9 o'clock. And on March the 2nd, uh, Freddie will be at the Mill Run Theater in Chicago. And starting the 26th of March, he and Jack Albertson will be at the Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami. Would you welcome Freddie Prinze? Looking good. Thank you. I went, I just was, came back from New York. I was there to visit all the Puerto Ricans. They had the Puerto Rican Day Parade. It was 500 cars going down separate streets, stalling out simultaneously. <laughs> All Chevys, right? I drive a Chevy, I drive a Corvette. Dude, I'm one of these crazy drivers, you know, like 90 miles an hour. I have a statue of the Virgin Mary on my dashboard. Whenever I drive, she goes, ah! Because <laughs> I'm a male under 25. My insurance is $1,000 a year. You know, but if I was a female under 25, it'd be 500. I call the insurance company, right? I said, well, this isn't fair. They said, all right, we'll compromise. We'll make it 650. Whenever you drive, you have to wear a dress. <laughs> That's right. I saw a cute guy the other day, too. <laughs> Did you see the Olympics? The Olympics were good, but there was no black people in the Olympics. Well, it was very hard to go down a ski slope at 90 miles an hour dribbling a basketball. <laughs> <laughs> the Puerto Ricans would have loved the Olympics, right? Great, go down the 90 mile an hour purse snatch. <laughs> Bye, baby. <laughs> they talk about all ethnic groups, though. It's like uh, Germans. Did you ever notice? Germans are great people, right? The French love them. They have them for house guests every 25 years. <laughs> but 
Germans cannot whisper. They just don't know how. God bless them, they try to whisper, but they can't whisper. You ever see them try, they go, Psst, that guy's queer. <laughs> That's why they lost the war, you know. <laughs> Tomorrow we attack Leningrad. Russians going eight o'clock, thank you. <laughs> and like, you know, if you take something simple, like asking the time. You go down south, you know, excuse me, do you know what time it is? Well, sure as hell do, hold on there. It's, uh, 3.30 or 9. <laughs> In there somewhere. <laughs> you know, yes, uh, yes, a uh, black dude in L.A. Do you know what time it is? Do I look like Big Ben you, sucker? <laughs> Ask one of my people, you know what time it is? Do you want to buy a watch, man? <laughs> so much is going on, no, no. Now, the bicentennial is real big, you know. Bicentennial, now they're doing all these things, pictures of George Washington all over the place, you know. Few people know George Washington smoked grass. Is this true? He had a plantation in Virginia. The main crop was hemp. I think we all know now that he smoked a cherry tree, right? I mean, who else throws coins across the Potomac? Somebody who's stoned. Hey, let's hit Indians, man. <laughs> Nixon went to China. Good. Yeah. Right? You know why he's there? The Chinese are giving him an award for screwing up our country. Yeah, you do very good, Rich. I have one million dollars. <laughs> I thought I saw him on the plane. I came back from New York, and for a minute, I just freaked. I said, oh, no, not on this plane, you know. Like, once I flew with Pat Boone, I knew we weren't going to crash. <laughs> You fly with Pat Boone, you stay up forever, you know. You don't have to land, they just drop you out and you float to the airport. Because you know? usually I'm afraid to fly because the pilots get me crazy. I wish they wouldn't talk at all, you know, but they wake you up. They always say things like, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're hitting a little air turbulence. There's no need for alarm. Please keep your seatbelts fastened. Thank you. Except when I'm on the plane, it's always, oh my God, we've had it. <laughs> then I love their little sightseeing tips, right? Like, uh, tch, tch, ladies and gentlemen, if you look above the plane, you can now see the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and there was all that talk about planes flying within 10 feet of each other. One passed us, it was so close, I saw a little kid in the window going, eh. <laughs> they stopped, they asked us for ice, you know. <laughs> planes are bad. <laughs> And those earphones, those stereo phones you pay two fifty four. how come only one side works and they try and meet in the center of your head? <laughs> eh? Hate to go to the bathroom on the plane, too, because everybody knows where you're going. <laughs> you take a magazine, they know what you're going to do. You, know? <laughs> you can't lie. You know, where are you going? Look out the window. <laughs> There's no window in the bathroom of planes, which is insane. Who's going to look at you, perverted seagull? <laughs> Hi, <-ya> <laughs> And now they have that camera with the TV so you can watch what the pilot's doing, right? It's very official. It's always, okay, we'll land in eight minutes, give me four flaps, you know. It's a video cassette. It's a film. That's not really them. They're in there going, you laugh. <laughs> Thank you. We gotta do this first, we'll be right back. I want to ask you about something I've been hearing about. You can confirm or deny. Oh, yes. Or oh, whatever. <laughs> we are back, and we're talking with Freddie Prince and Joey Bishop, and we have Betty Derrick and Ray Johnson with us. Has this a, a publicly been made uh, uh, known that you are, uh, you're gonna become a father soon? Uh, I'm not sure, but yeah, any day What now. do you mean you're not sure? Well, I'm sure that she's gonna have the baby, yeah. Oh. I'm sure it's mine, too. Of course. <laughs> But, well, congratulations. Uh, thank you. Any day. Yeah, they, they, they said March 10th, but I don't know. Well, yeah. no. I, I, I met your, uh, your wife. She's a very lovely girl. Thank you. And you're just 22. Yeah, That's we, a we, big the thing responsibility, about it, you know, to take on. Well, yeah, you know, what, what people were telling me about, though, was uh, said you got married young, right. but that, uh, say, babies do any day, but we married six months ago. <laughs> For all you gossipy little month counters. <laughs> and, uh, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that, you know. I, well, you're married. For me, it's, it's great. You know, Puerto Rican usually have 40 kids in three months, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get back our island. We need manpower, for God's sake. No, but, so this is... Are you excited about it? Oh, yeah. I'm like a basket case, you know, like a... She said, well, you have to pack a bag for when I go to the hospital. Absolutely. You know, and I packed my own bag. No, you're supposed to pack her I bag. I know. I realize I have to pack her bag, you know, and... Uh, 
Then she gets me nervous because I have to do the breathing exercises with her. Oh, she's going to do the natural one? Yeah. Natural childbirth? Yeah, and I'm, I'm there for it. You the, are in the delivery in room? In the room when the store comes in. And uh, <laughs> you have to breathe with, with your wife. I'm like, the it's panic. to help her uh, relax, yeah. right? The dog was staring at us when we were doing it. it like... <laughs> Next thing you know, they'll be at the bowl with the food. Oh, God. But uh, it's, it's great, you know, because like, uh, I was, you know, we planned to get married last year. Right. And uh, you come from a large family? No, I just have a brother and a sister. Just really? And they're both in Puerto Rico. They're married. That's good. <laughs> not to each other, but they're married. Well, <laughs> people think we're kinky, but not yeah. that good. But uh, I read someplace last week where it says people who become parents now, what it costs to raise a child to the age 18. Could you, do you have any idea? No. About $100,000. Maybe it's not too late to get an abortion. <laughs> oh, no, no, don't say that. <laughs> no, no. Oh, I'm only kidding, America. I wouldn't do a thing like that. $100,000. Does that frighten you at all? Well, what you do is wow. wait till he's 17 and get rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> Save all that last year's expense. Save all that last year's money. No, I don't, you know, I don't care. Because so uh, I've been saving my money. You have? Yeah, I've, all I bought was uh, my house, my parents' house, some land, and uh, a car. Because you know, I'm a speed maniac. Yeah. You know, with the cars. Uh, I mean, uh, motorcycles, anything... You know, the cops, they know me, because I always chase them. That's how fast the car is. You had any major fights yet since you've been married? Yeah, we had one biggie. One biggie, I, uh... You mean where it's time to say, get out, you know, and I'm going to oh. stay over and don't call me and all that? And don't ever call again. That's what it was. It was, uh... See, at late at night, I watch a lot of the old movies in my house, and you know, about Marx Brothers and Fields and everything. And, uh, when you're a newlywed, they think you're bored if the third month you're in the room with a film till three in the morning. What's he watching? You know, she thought it was a porno flick or something. She comes in and she says, what do you want? I said, the Marx Brothers. And he goes, okay, great, you're leaving me for Groucho. And she starts saying that I was sick. You know, that no one stays up till three in the morning watching old movies. And I watch videotapes of myself. Right. You know, because I say, they yep, made a mistake there, lose that, you know, to, to get better, yeah. to learn comedy. And uh, so she got crazy. We had a big fight. But now everything's smoothed over. It takes a lot of, a lot of tolerance in marriage. I, well, I'm giving him advice. I'm, I'm the one to give advice. <laughs> It's like asking the captain of the Hindenburg, you think you can bring it in all right? You betcha. Just, I'll tie up right over there. Uh, no, but... You don't worry me. Those but... of us who have had some problems sometimes are in a position to... Uh, well, bomb. the alimony is what scares everybody. When I got married... I... <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> See, I got married in Vegas, and I called up my friend Nat in New York, this black dude, and I said, Nat, I'm in Vegas and I'm getting married. He said, if you're going to gamble, why don't you play blackjack? <laughs> Because, you know, that alimony, I thought about that. And people said, well, you know, you can have your wife sign a paper beforehand. Oh, right. Oh. And then, you know, how they hold that in your face, you know. No, that's no way to start You it, never right. loved me. You made me sign a contract. That's right. And well, I know from contract, believe me. Anyway, I hope the baby is, uh, comes on time, as well and healthy, and, and it'll Thank make you. a difference in your life. Yes. I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it because I love kids and, uh, and animals and things like that. So... <laughs> Well, that's great. Thank Happy you. Point. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Betty Garrett's with us and Ray Johnson. <laughs> Betty Garrett is with us tonight. She's been with us before. She is a delightful entertainer. And a show called Betty Garrett and Other Songs is going to be the initial production of the new Palm Springs Center Theater, which uh, bows March 8th and March 10th. Would you welcome, please, Miss Betty Garrett. <laughs> Thank you. Did you know, have you met everybody here before, or? Uh, everybody but Freddie. Yes. Yeah. What do you mean? Now you're putting his honor. Huh? Well, this, this Freddie. Freddie. I thought you were talking Freddie. about Freddie DeCordova. No, no, that, that Freddie I know for longer than... How are you, dear? Just fine. You're good. How's you? you looking forward to your show opening? I sure am. It's going to be very exciting. It's a brand new theater yeah. there. It's in that wonderful old building that was the old art museum in Palm yeah. Springs. This is really then a one-woman type of... Uh... Yeah, uh huh. Except I have Jerry Dolan, my accompanist, right. with me, and a bass player, Putter Smith, and and uh, the three of us are up there right. all the time. But. This is really like, an, and you don't see that much here. It's kind of like an English music hall. Yeah. Where yeah, people exactly. like Gracie Fields used to come out and work in one and uh, right. do songs and patter and so forth. Yeah, thank you for the comparison. <laughs> well, that's some pretty good company. Yeah. What do you do? You, you one night you hear you sing. What kind of old songs? Different, I mean... Yeah, well, my show's not just old songs. It really takes the history of my life from the very 
my childhood and that the routine I did last time involved a lot of those songs that I grew up with because my mother was uh, uh, worked in a music store but then the show goes on uh, through my career and then to songs that I would like to do not just the ones that I have done but some of the wonderful Stephen Sondheim and Jacques Brel and people like that so it, it's quite a large spectrum and in, in between songs are stories about the songs and stories of things that have happened to me, mostly funny. What's the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to you on stage? Everybody has one terrible night where they, they make a wrong entrance or they completely go up in their lines or I do that at least effect. once a week. Do you have one of those minor disasters? <laughs> oh, dear, yeah. I have a lot of good stories that cover those kind of things because I'm, I'm famous for making boo-boos. But that's a great thing about doing a one-woman show. Nobody else is really dependent on you. And Jerry Dolan, my accompanist, seems to f feel when I'm going to make a mistake and is able to follow me. But uh, There's some wonderful theater stories. You don't know how many of them are apocryphal or real, but of, of tricks that other actors have played on other actors. And there was one on Broadway quite a few years ago where somebody would ring a phone on stage or the sound effect just to drive somebody crazy because the actors would be in the middle of and the phone would ring. <laughs> and somebody had to obviously answer the phone. There were two actors working. And one of them finally picked up the phone and turned to the other one and said, it's for you. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's true, but it's one of the great stories of oh, all I time. Love, I love it. You know, because when you're in a, a play for any length of time, people get a little, a little tired and they do, invent sure, little yeah, pieces sure. of business to keep their own uh, energy level up yeah. and do silly things like that. Have you ever have? Have you ever just gone completely blank? Oh, in front absolutely! Of a crowd and, uh... I, I once went blank in the middle of singing "South America, Take It Away," which has a lyric that goes, "Take back your rumba, take back your samba, take back your conga," and if you don't say them in that order, the next line won't rhyme. So I got out and I just drew an absolute blank. So I said. Take back your scrana sky, canana pie, could you little bye bye lie? And that your mother I, your father I, and your brother I. And I went on like that for the a audience? whole course. The audience never knew the difference. Probably thought it was a new That's set of lyrics or something. Sad thing about it. it was awful. Didn't you do a song uh, called Okal Dokal? Uh, Okal Baby Dokal. Okal Baby Dokal. What was yeah, that? Called? You know Sidney Miller. Sure. Yeah, well, Sidney wrote that song. It's just, it was in the first picture I ever made. Uh, and I sang it to Margaret O'Brien. And then. I taught it to Margaret O'Brien. It was just a kind of a nonsense song. Okle baby, Okle baby, Okle baby don't Okle go baby. I go like a love will you. It's a form of pig Latin, I think. Okle, no, that pig Latin is Igpe Atlan. No, but the, one of those kinds of, follow yeah. me. We're going to get into the Latin stuff here? Yeah. Pig Latin? With it? Yes. Yeah. Mouse Latin. Okle baby don't go. Okle baby don't go. That's easy. Right. I go like a love will you. I go like a love will you. <laughs> I go like a love will you. Okle baby don't go like a like a hug will you. Oh, right. Would you like to spend the next half hour just talking to my grandson like this? Blah, 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 blah. Let him spit on you. Uh, what are you going to do for us tonight? Are you going to do... Somebody mentioned the song Goofus. Yeah. Is that the one that goes... I was thinking this afternoon. Is that the no. one that goes... Yeah, well, I know the medley. Yeah. Goofus. That's Goofus, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I'm going to do it. But I didn't know there were lyrics to it. Uh, oh, absolutely. Great lyrics to it. It's an old, old song. I didn't think anybody remembered that anymore. I know the tune. I want to do it because I'm going to play with my new toy. I have a new ukulele, a brand new ukulele. And you, okay. You want to do it from here? You want to do it over there? No, I have to do it over there because I have right. to use Jerry. Would you like to take it out of the box is, first? It's yeah. much easier. This is, um, this bum, is, bum, bum, I can't bum. mention the name because I think it's a plug if I do, but this is the Stradivarius of ukuleles. It's Let's see if it's in tune. Sounds pretty fun. good. I love it. I have to tell you a story about this. Uh, my mother played the ukulele, and uh, uh, she played quite well and had a nice, lovely, low voice. I play terribly. I'm a uh, female George Siegel, really. I, I <laughs> oh, don't let George hear you say that. <laughs> play George, very bad ukulele. George thinks he plays with great I know he style. does. Well, it, it's style, but uh, uh, I play about like that. Anyway, my mother played the ukulele, and at the end of every song, she had a little phrase that she used to say. I don't know why, I don't know what it meant. It would go like this, it would go, ta -a -a I don't know, it was supposed to be imitation of the ukulele or something, that would sound like that. And she'd be singing a beautiful love song, like, a, I, I love you truly, truly dear. ta -a -a 
Thank you. U K E. No. Wrong. Wrong. You know? Do you know? I think I know. Ten seconds, yeah. Joey. Uh, does that mean whoever is supposed to write gets you to get host the show? Mm, <laughs> sorry, your time is up. U K U L E L E. Good. Is that right? You're right. You're the only person I've ever. How do you know how to spell ukulele? Give me any word. What? Khrushchev. Khrushchev. K R U S C H E V. Wrong. No. Oh, you want it spelled correctly? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What do I know? You said Khrushchev. You want it spelled correctly? Ask me. It's K H R U S H C H E V. U K U L E L E. Ukulele. Guitar. G U I S. My D O G. Go ahead. We got mouse. <laughs> mouse. D O G. Good. Does right. he know? We have to take a break. We'll be right back. Stay with us. You too. Ray Johnson is with us again. He has been with us before, but I think the first time that he was on the show, people almost thought it was a, was a joke or was a put-on because he uh, has spent half of his life, or did spend half of his life, in prison. The only men with a couple of others to escape from Folsom Prison. He wrote a book about it called Too Dangerous to Be at Large, and uh, since his release in 1970, he's been uh, working of, uh, for the government on studies and dealing with armed robbery and traveling around the country, lecturing on the subject. Would you welcome, please, Ray Johnson. <laughs> The reason I mentioned be that some people thought maybe we might be joking the first night was because before I'd met you, I kind of expected to meet somebody who spent, what, 25 years uh, in prison, kind of embittered and, and vindictive, and yet you didn't seem to have that attitude. You may harbor some of it somewhere, but it, but it doesn't show at all. Well, I, you know, I have some hostility, but one thing I wanted to mention to you, uh, that I, maybe this isn't the forum to do it, but I heard you and Joey talking about politics. Right. And I'm running for public office in San Diego. Are you really? I really am. Now, I don't, I don't think we can mention what office you're running for. No. Because if we do, then we are under what they call the equal time provision, and every candidate who is running for office really has a right. We well, made a mistake once we came out to Burbank from California one year, and we mentioned something about one of the candidates running for mayor, and there were about nine people running. And we had to give two minutes apiece to nine candidates in a row running for the mayor of Burbank, which was a snappy 18 minutes, I want to tell you. <laughs> My name is Walter Brick, and I'm running, I want to tell you, it was grim. Well, I haven't... So when I... you say you're running for office, you yeah. aren't really running for office. Well, I haven't... Just say that, even if you okay, are. Okay, I'm not really... We're off the hook. I haven't picked the, picked the office anyway. Okay. But all I've heard in the last few months is there's nothing but crooks in politics. And no, I'm serious. And I just now you're gonna prove it, yeah, huh? I just, <laughs> I just no, I'm serious. Sorry about that. that well, well, thanks, John. No, but when somebody has served their time, actually, then it, that should be people find that emotionally hard to erase from their mind, do they not? Don't you get that attitude that if you're an ex-convict, they still put that stigma on you? He's an ex-convict, and if you served your time, and the people says, okay, you're out, it should be. Starting from a well, scratch, I, but how I, can I, it? We'd like it like that, but it doesn't work that way. Um, for instance, in California, there are a jillion things that you, I, I'll never be allowed to do unless they change the laws. For example? Well, I can't be a beautician, a barber, taxi cab driver, undertaker, uh, and the list is endless. Yeah. As an ex-felon, you mean? Yeah. Now, why do they why? choose those certain, you just mentioned those certain ones, I can see why maybe an well, undertaker? I really well, I mean, probably they figure out uh, you might go out and drum up some business. I, I don't, I really don't know. Uh, it just, you know, I think they, you know, they have uh, their traditional things. They but go a back. hairdresser, a beautician? Well, you remember years ago in barber shops, a lot of booking went on and those kinds of oh, things. Oh, I see. That's it's, interesting. You know, it's got a rationale. I don't think it applies today, but. Right. I didn't know that. We Not have to take that a break I want to be any of those things. Right, we have to take one short break and we're going to come back and follow up on this. with uh, Ray Johnson. I don't know if I've asked you this before. What is the, I suppose it depends on the person, what's the initial reaction you get from people when they find out you've spent half your life in jail? Do you, do you find them get a little apprehensive? Or, uh... Um, some do, some don't. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I talked about last time about living in my bus and, uh, you know, I was parked on the cliffs in La Jolla and 
this lady came along and uh, she says, I saw you on the car, I know who you are. And she said, what are you down here to steal? You know, and I told her, well, you know, I've stole a lot of things in my life, but I've never stole a lifeguard station. And, and that's, you know, uh, you know, I don't know what to say to him. Then on the other side of the coin, recently in a, my favorite pub in La Jolla, man come up and says, look, I hope I don't embarrass you, but he says, I'm really locked out of my car. I can't get in my car. And, <laughs> could you? So, uh, so I mean, it's and good. were you able to uh, yes, help I, him? Yes, I was able to People help ask him. me that all the time. I know that. Me, can you open the car? I say, no problem. <laughs> but only Chebbies. Only Chebbies. Only Chebbies. <laughs> what's, what's the closest, if there is any indication that did arise? Have you been in any kind of trouble? Uh, well, not real trouble. You know, I mentioned about doing the robbery study for the government. And right. one of the things that I did was to go out to stores late at night and look at them as I would, you know, if I was a robber. And I had certain things, questions I would ask, like how much money you got in the cash register, do you have a gun? You know, little things like this. And somehow this store hadn't been notified. And <laughs> this young lady about two in the morning was really apprehensive. So I said, well, look, would you feel more comfortable calling the store owner, you know, because he knows about this. And she says, yeah, I really would. So she called the police. And every cop in the world arrived. And, you know, I showed them all my, I got a shotgun in my ear, and they got me over the hood of the car. And she said, I think I'm being robbed. And uh, so anyway, I talked, you know, talked to them, showed them all my identification. They said, well, uh, we, we got to run a make on you. And they had a, you, ever, you see the car computers? No. You know, they run all your well, stuff. Well, they can in. get all that information oh, yeah. right now. And this thing started printing back, and it just printed and printed and printed. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> finally, the, uh, the sergeant, you know, they finally checked out and believed us for real. And he says, look, he says, I've been on the you know, police department 25 years. You know, I really believe that you're doing all this. But I want you to know off the record, you're up to something, and I know it. He <laughs> still wouldn't believe it. You still wouldn't believe it. And I thought, my God, when that shotgun, they stuck it up in my head, I thought, you know, here I am doing the Lord's work, and now I'm going to get killed. You know, and I never got hurt while I was a criminal. And I thought, you know, I'm going <laughs> to get wasted. Now you're trying to do something nice? Yeah, I'm going to get wasted, sure as hell. That's... Does luck, I don't want to uh, promote armed robbery, obviously. No. <laughs> obviously. Obviously, it didn't work for you. Well, the hours you... were OK. The hours are great. <laughs> Hours are great, but doesn't it require somewhere a certain amount of luck? I mean, well, if you keep at it long enough. Uh, yeah, I um, I robbed a nightclub one time. Um, that's a switch. <laughs> yeah. Because usually they rob you if you've never been to some of them. <laughs> Maybe I got even for all of us. But I, you know, got into this place, and um, there was only the, the owner and his wife and a bar boy and a couple of their friends. You know, and the whole place was closed up. So I, you know, put my gun on him, and uh, this lady at the end of the bar, who turned out to be the owner's wife, was kind of smashed. And she says, are you a real robber? And I said, yes, ma'am, I really am. And she, in a real sort of stage voice, she says, Harry, do you think he knows about the cigar box? <laughs> and so I... Helpful wife that she was. So, you know, naturally, I said, Okay, Harry, what about Where's the this? cigar box? And there was $9,000 in it. And uh, I heard later that I think he went up for manslaughter or something. I, I don't, I, no, I'm kidding. I don't think there's a jury that would have convicted him either. But he looked at her. Yeah, so luck does, you know, right. I, I would have got probably maybe five, six, eight thousand dollars $8,000, and it turned out that it was a good night's work. Is it, <laughs> is it true that if a professional burglar, a thief, wants to get into someone's house, there's very little they can do? I mean, they can take certain precautions, right? But if they're determined to get in. Well, yeah, the real pros, I think uh, there isn't, uh, I don't think there's anything that they don't find a way around. Uh, I recently was asked by, I, I won't mention it, a burglar alarm, a new burglar alarm, to come and look and see what I thought about it. And it's pretty effective. And, but I said, you know, I see some ways that you could beat this thing. And the guy says, oh, well, show me. And so, you know, like in 10 minutes, I demonstrated two or three ways that I thought you might get by it. So now they're going to hopefully improve that. <clears throat> yeah, but I think, you know, professional crooks spend as much time learning their trade as I'm sure you learn, did learning yours. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Not as successful. I think I'm being sentenced. I don't know right now. I'm going up into the slammer. Um, you mentioned there's a lot of um, there's a lot of social 
uh, strata in prisons, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, certain distinct... Yeah, it is. It, it's a microcosm, I think, right. of, the, of the world in there, yeah. They, um, you know, for instance, medium of exchange. You know, we don't have money as right. such, so we use cigarettes, you know, things like this. But it has, uh, uh, you know, it, well, it, it's changed. When I first went to prison, like, people that dealt with dope were really bad people. Nobody liked them. Uh, they have now uh, have a sort of a preeminence in prison. Right. Yeah, you know, they've made it up the social ladder. What is the worst crime that, that, that inmates themselves look upon? Kidnapping or ransom? No, or child molesters are at the bottom of the barrel. Really? Yeah, they are really treated very badly. Do I? Mr. Friedian. So, um, are you enjoying your job, this work you're doing now? Well, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of exciting. I'm running about the country uh, lecturing and uh, trying to save the world from crime. Um, getting, oh, I got a really, I'm, I want you to know that I'm big in Salina, Ohio, as oh. a result of you. Uh, I get fan mail from there and Why presents. Why Salina? I don't know. I've never even heard of the place, but... Uh, um, I mean, there's an outpouring of mail from Salina, yeah, Ohio? Yeah, yeah. And I got a... Do they have a prison there, or...? No. They're just, uh, just, just folks in Salina. They dig robbery, I guess. I, don't know. I thank you, all right? It's always great to have you here. Great. I hope you'll come back and visit us frequently. Betty, I hope you have a grand opening. March the 10th? March the 10th, the same time your baby's gonna be born. Yes, indeed. Be well, a great I night. Yeah. Hope you have a great opening, too, Freddie. <laughs> great opening. That's opening night, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's like night a supermarket, is. but it's... Uh... And uh, enjoy <laughs> March 11th up in Las Vegas, no, right? Feb March 11th is when I'm finishing. Oh, oh March 11th. February the 26th ah. is when I open this Thursday. So if you go in March 11th, they'll just get your last show. <laughs> if they come in February the 26th, they may catch my last show. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. I'm humbled by that applause.